Let's go, Rider Nation. I'm ready. I'm ready. There's our can of Kings. Here we go. This is your Saskatchewan Rough Riders fan podcast, the Piffles podcast. Thanks for joining us wherever you get us uh, listening on your favorite podcast platform, watching on YouTube or Sastel Max TV on demand. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Hope you enjoy. As always, you got me. I'm Alex. I'm Steve. And I don't know what to do with myself. We haven't won four in a row since, what, 2013? I believe so. Yep. Well, started the season anyway. Start, to yeah. start the year, yes. So, so something happened then. What was it? Um, uh, 2013, 2013. 2013. I had a lot more hair back in 2013. Uh, so did I. I had, a, I had a few less pounds. Um, uh, I don't know. Something happened then. We'll figure out eventually. I don't know. You're also we'll Greg. Wow. Just in case, I, I, in case people need I, I, I only... I no. only do that when you're not here because yeah, did that last week and it yeah, we're, yeah, threw me off. Here. Yeah, <laughs> uh, you can give us a follow on social media. We're on X at Piffles Pod. I'm at Real Alex D. You can find me at Safamud. And as always, I do not need nor want your pity follows at Greg on Sports. Uh, check us out on Facebook as well, and of course the website PifflesPodcast.com. Piffles Podcast is brought to you by our great friends at Dairy Queen on Elphinstone Street and Sass Drive in Regina. And this week, with it being 30-some-odd degrees just about every single day, if you're not going to Dairy Queen on Elphinstone Street this week, I don't know what's wrong with you. Peach because... Cobbler will change your oh. mind, will change your world. That's what That thing's legit. I haven't had still... that one yet. I think I need to. Really? Oh, it's so good. V-good. V-good. Yeah, it, yeah. Um, well, we're here to talk all things riders, including their 4 0 start, which I don't know if anybody saw that coming. Let's get right to it. Let's get to the opening kickoff. <laughs> so, the riders you know who didn't see it coming, Steve. Let's call him out for it right now. I did. I picked the Argos. I. I'm shocked. I'm okay with that. I'm happy to be wrong this week. And you're going to see me pick BC later on in the episode. Maybe what worked for Alex early in the season has passed over to me. Nothing worked for me early in the season. We want to talk about pick them. Literally nothing worked for me early in the season until last week. I went four and against the, yeah, the Bombers. You become like, yeah, become Kurt Henning out of nowhere. Yeah. Um, yeah. Still mad. I wish I would have got that bombers one wrong though. Um, We'll we'll get that'll be in our Piffles picks, um, but right now let's talk about the Riders beating the Argos 30-23, moving their record to four and zero. And I just teased it. Went like I didn't see this coming to start the season, and I think like I think over the last couple of years with the hot starts that the team had, that we could kind of expect the team to be competitive in the first couple of games this year. But to be four and zero to me, I. I was not expecting that whatsoever. I was hoping maybe for two and two and to be four and oh is just fantastic right now. I think especially after Trevor Harris went down, a lot of people were right to be hesitant going into this week, but you look at that defense, like it is going, like I cannot wait for this game against BC because it is legit to be best on best their yes. offense versus our defense and it is going to be a beautiful game. I mean, you, you can look at this team, go 4-0. and oh, It all comes down to that defense and the turnovers. Plus 10. 14 ter- takeaways through four games this year. I mean, what else can you say? They're, they're playing exciting football. It's fun. And they are playing for their head coach, which we haven't seen in two years outside of a bowling alley. You've been reading my articles talking about leadership. Um, <laughs> I do. I read every one of them. Wow. Yeah. You missed the hashtag though. My two, uh, my two listens or views from 
Thank you. My mom's probably the other one. The other one. Um, hey, I read it too because, like I said, you missed a hashtag. Well, I'm happy up at three. <laughs> there you go. Um, okay, well, let's. Steve, you talk about the takeovers or the takeaways and and the plus ten um, that they're at right now. There's 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 two things about that, and one we'll start about we'll start with the offense. Is they're not giving the ball away, and we saw that with Shea Patterson in his first start, and yeah, it was it was a little rocky to start. That was not a fun first quarter whatsoever. But once he hit that pass to Jareth Stearns over the middle for, what was it, 26 yards, he calmed down and he was, I think he was 14 of 18 the rest of the way. Like he was very, very solid and they're doing, they're, they're making good decisions, whether they're great throws or not. It's just, even if it's throwing the ball away, they're making good decisions, check downs, whatever they're doing, and they're not turning the ball over. It's, it's clear to me that this coaching staff um, Corey Mace is preaching about just get the football on offense. Make sure you have the football. Do not give it away on defense. Go get that ball. And that's exactly what I'm seeing from this team right now. That well, first that quarter, honestly, he looked like a rookie quarterback balls at receivers feet. He hit an Argo right in the chest. I don't know how that didn't go back for six, but you're right. There was a clear moment where something flipped in his head. And the confidence came in. And we saw the quarterback that we saw in preseason. He's got the accuracy to play this style of football. He just needed to get to it. And it, I'll take, what was it, 16 to 21 for 192? I'll take that every game. With this defense that we've got, all he needs to do is manage a football game. That's it. Well, and if you look at the overall stats between the two teams, the Argos passing was 241 to our 192. The rushing was basically a split. It's those turnovers that was the big, the biggest deal. Cameron Dukes just kept on, well, and not all those interceptions were his fault, but the Argos were turning the ball over and the Riders weren't. And that it makes a big difference in a seven-point game. Oh, yeah, there's not a lot of times you're going to lose a football game going 5 nothing in the turnover battle. Simply put, and two Riders of those were, what's that? Yeah, well, yeah. I said not rare, not all the time, but half of those interceptions were were on uh, on Coxy. The other half were absolutely on Cameron Dukes making mistakes, and the defense being prepared. Simple as that. They're giving the the offense short fields to work with after those turnovers, and yeah, you're not going to put up a lot of yards when you only have to go with thirty yards on a drive. Right. So on Shea Patterson, what like I, I'm I'm surprised the offense wasn't tailored a little bit more towards his style of play and allowing him to run around a little bit. We saw him try and, and stick to be a pocket passer a little bit. Once he did hit that pass to Darius Stearns, he did start to move around a little bit. Obviously, that touchdown run, that's exactly what his game is. Um were you guys surprised at, at the game that Mark Mueller called at all? I also think a lot of it, though, is what they were giving. Toronto was stacking the box, trying to box both him and AJ in. So I think that was a lot of it. They were like, okay, Toronto was going, oh, we know this kid can run. Let's make sure he beats us with his arm. And so they were trying to make him one-dimensional. I'm not really surprised at all. I, I think... I think this is exactly the type of offense Mueller wants to run no matter who's behind center. And I feel like they kept the guys behind Harris who best portrayed that style of offense. I don't think we're going to see a difference or much of one in the offense, no matter who's behind center. And I prefer it that way. I At this and point in the season, I prefer a more vanilla offense anyway. I don't want to be like Winnipeg throwing everything in the kitchen sink just to scrape together a win. Like let's, let's go with what we know and let's, let's bring out the bag of tricks when we need them. And Patterson was getting a lot of help from his players around him. I can't, there, there's two, I want to single out here. Uh, the first one, obviously Samuel em Emelis with his touchdown and the spin move on that, the spin and the, and the stiff arm in one move. Um, Fantastic. We've all seen the highlights uh, of that. Um, but to me, it was it was 
was it earlier in that? It might have been earlier in that drive. It was Keen Schaefer Baker who had about a six yard catch and pushed three guys and fought for that first down. And it's just fighting for those extra yards, those little things. That's what's so great about this team right now is you're getting those kind of efforts. And when you get those kind of efforts, I know it's so cliche and one of my favorite movies, any given Sunday, the inches are all around us. Right. But that's exactly what it was. And we saw that take shape in, in that Argos game and they fought for every single yard that they got. And it, it worked out quite well. Well, you want to talk about the little things, a Joe Joe there is becoming a, as a rookie is a very good blocking receiver. Blocking? He, he what, you can tell you can tell he is not scared to initiate contact. He and it looks like he enjoys it, which is awesome because he's coming across there just messing guys up. You want to talk about a guy who enjoys contact? Our our running back, AJ Ouellette. If you ever watch him run out of bounds, something is wrong with him. Because he he does not every time he's got the ball, he's running at somebody. He wants to hit somebody. And it looks like everybody on the field, no matter who they are, from uh, starting play, starting quarterback to your your backup special teams guy, every single player has seems like they've bought into whatever Corey Mace is selling because they're they are playing balls to the wall football, and it's it, it's such a nice change over what we've seen again. Not to harp on the last few years, but it just feels like there's just that whole attitude shift that starts at the top the last time i've seen an attitude shift from a team like this uh specifically with the riders was 2006 to 2007 yes just when kent took over from from uh danny barrett there was just that shift in, in mentality that we weren't going to settle for anything we're going to go out there and we're going to get it we're going to earn it and that's what i'm seeing with Corey mace's team so I think the comparisons are there and I was, I was saying, maybe I said it to you guys, but I'm, I'm getting this weird feeling about this team. It's giving me 2007 vibes and I'm not saying they're going to finish the season like that. I hope they do, but it's just, it, it doesn't feel like 2013 uh, because that was a veteran team that was, you know, built for that one specific year, right? This is different. This, this feels like the building of, of something special. And I, I love what I'm seeing so far from this team. Well, you look at that foundation they laid in 2007, other than the hiccup in 2008. And I wouldn't even call it like the team was good. They just were, had QB issues because they couldn't make a decision on the right. To, Everybody the had right a broken guy. leg too. Well, that too. But you look at 2009, 2010. Yes. The writers didn't come home with the championship, but they were the best of the West and were very close uh, to, uh, to great cups. And so, yeah, let's, let's hope this is a 2007 foundation building year. If we can have that string of success that we had after 2007 for the next six to seven years, oh, mosaic will be filled again. And we can stop hearing articles about how bad our attendance is at 24,000 people. Okay. Well, maybe we can, maybe we can bring up the dynasty word. <laughs> Okay, well, let's we'll do the attendance right now since you brought it up. Twenty three thousand nine hundred and twenty three, the lowest attended game at Mosaic Stadium um, Thursday night. After, you know, it's a short week for short work week with uh, Canada Day being there. So everyone's on holidays. Are you guys upset by that number? No. Because it doesn't bother me at all. And it didn't feel like a crowd that was less than 24,000. Like that was a lively crowd. There's, there's two things that have me not too worried about it. One, I got stuck at work out of town. Um, so I knew I wasn't going to make in time for game day. So I put up all four of my seats. Be, and just because whatever, I'm not going to make there. Hopefully I can get my money back for them. They sold Part almost immediately. Fam. Yeah, that's exactly what it was. <laughs> uh, but they sold almost immediately. There was times in the last couple of years where I put my seats up days in advance for face value and like no takers. Like I had to swallow them. So oh. that, that doesn't have me worried about it. Plus 
any team in the East that wants to harp on the Riders for losing their uh, losing their fan base, their teams would kill for twenty four thousand fans in their stadiums. Any any team in the East? How about any team not Winnipeg without a fifty cent concert beforehand? But let's be honest, twenty four thousand is great in the CFL. And you mentioned it. There seems to be interest again in the team. You know, I I drive on the weekends for Uber, and I I've noticed already this early in the season. That if I'm walking my jersey on a Friday night, every other passenger is is ready to talk football. And that hasn't been the case for the last few years. It's been very quiet. And it's been, even on game day, you, you used to see green everywhere. The last couple of years, not so much. Now you're starting to see it come back. It's going to take time for that to build at the stadium again. The, between the poor showing on the field, the ticket price increases and everything that's gone on, it'll take time to build back up to those 28, 29,000 person games. But under Corey Mace, I don't think it'll take us that long. And that was my problem at the, the, the this entire narrative of the teams four and zero, and the riders can't get fill a stadium. Like what, what, what more do these fans want? They want to not be fooled again. <laughs> you look at those teams the last couple of years, they did fairly decent. Like last year, Go back to the archive. Like we're talking about, like, hey, like this team's looking in the playoff spot. You know, they could challenge for first, and and then Labor Day happens, and like, like right now, this team makes the playoffs. Like we're going, they're going to gain incrementally over the year, over the season if they can keep this up. They're not going to go undefeated all year, but if they can keep on playing tight and playing good and make the playoffs, then next year's where you're going to see your gains. It's going to take some time to gain the trust back. I think all it takes is one win after Labor Day. That that's all we it's, want. It's <laughs> get to the playoffs. If they get to the playoffs, you're going to see fans come back. Doesn't even have to be a home playoff game. Just get into the playoffs again, and then next year tickets sales will be up. So I'm with you guys. I'm not worried about it. And it's like I said, Thursday of a short week out-of-towners everybody was at the lake everybody was gone they're camping and i think it was a multitude of factors yes prices prices of tickets have you know that effect on it too there's there's that side of it but i'm not i'm not worried about it not right now anyway um back to the game um i want to uh throw one more shout out on offense to mitch Pickton. um i know we've been calling uh, Jared Stearns, Mr. Second Down and Clutch and everything, but Mitch picked in those two first down conversions in the fourth quarter to ice the game. Uh, the second one on a um, throw that not a lot of rookies should be making, throwing across the body, but at least picked in was wide open in the middle of the field. Um, just excellent plays and just important plays. And it's little things like that and kind of fitting to me because Mark Guy was in attendance uh, for the the Eras Tour game. Um, it was just fitting that someone under the radar, like a Mitch Pickton, made those second down conversions to ice the game. Same way Mark Guy made those big catches in the 89 Grey Cup to extend the drive uh, for Dave Ridgway to hit the kick. Would he be a distinguished alumni? <laughs> he should be. Absolutely. Mark Guy is not appreciated enough here in Ryderville. He's not. You're no I'm, I you know I'm just throwing shade at Hamilton, but yeah, no, There's I more just, shade Hamilton coming. Yeah. I got a list here, don't worry. You brought the receipts? Yeah, exactly. Um but it was fitting that it was that it was picked in um just to get those with Mark Guy there. I thought that was excellent. Feels like Pickton. every time we start to write the guy off, he does something to remind us why we keep him around. Literally every time, like I get get a Joe a Joe in there to take his spot. Picton comes in and has two clutch catches to win the game. It's just there's a reason he has made it through a couple of uh, different management levels and head coaches. He will be on this team for a while. Picton is what the uh, Dumb and Dumber meme. And he, just when I think uh, you go and do something. <laughs> Oh, you do is just redeem yourself. Yeah, like, yeah, like no Picton, like smart play when he when he uh, drifted out. No one was around him on that first no one. one at all. 
And then that, that was an easy first down, especially in that situation because they were deep in their zone. And that other second down catch, um, yeah, that was a little more contested, but he held on. Like He's a sure-handed receiver, but yeah, he's not – unfortunately for him, he's not a JoJo. He's not KSB. He's not MLS. He's always going to be fourth – on the uh, of the new Canadian Air Force, but he's a great player to have on that team because he he's a lunch pail kid who goes and packs his uh, p- puts on his helmet and plays plays his heart out every game. You need those guys on your roster. Um, well, let's flip to that second or to the to the defense and let's start right up front with the D line. That interior I thought was fantastic in this game. I thought they had their best game getting consistent pressure on the quarterback dukes was under pressure pretty much the entire game he didn't have a lot of uh you know steamboats back there waiting to try and find receivers to get open um especially with the injuries that they had on the d-line where three guys got hurt um i just thought the d-line should get a lot of credit for that game especially micah johnson in the fourth quarter he was gassed but he was still chasing guys to the sidelines, making plays and getting to the quarterback. And when you have three guys hurt and you don't have anybody else back there, that was, that was really, really impressive to me. Yeah. Micah Johnson chasing after Dukes was one of the funniest things (laughs) I've ever seen in my life, (laughs) but he dude's a beast. Like everyone, Everyone keeps on looking at Micah Johnson like, okay, this is the year he's going to take that step back. This is the year he's going to take that step back. He, he nope. He's still playing at a high level. And don't get me wrong, at some point, Father Time never loses. But right now, he's playing some of the best football I've seen him play in this league, and he's played a lot of great football. You know, you look at the groups that we've gone up against, Hamilton uh, with James Butler, Edmonton with Kevin Brown, and now Toronto with... Kadeem Carey, who was lights out to start the season, the fact that we still haven't given up 100 yards rushing in a single game is absurd. It's clear where this team is forcing things. They want to stop the run and make that make these guys beat them with their arms. And with the defensive backfield that we've got, that's a winning formula. So it's, it's all on that front four, and they're going to be tested this week after... You know, if the first day, day of practice comes out, we saw some injuries and some long-term injuries that are going to see some rotations, and it's going to be interesting to see if they can keep it up against a very high-powered offense in BC. Well, and those injuries to the D-line, Charbel DeBeer, ACL injury, Christian Albright, ACL injury, Malik Carney missed a lot of that game um, against Toronto. So it's a good thing that Miles Brown is available because he'll slide right back in there. Um, I don't know if they're going to add another pass rusher somewhere uh, for the rotation, but I guess we'll, we'll see what happens throughout the week and, and going to the roster because they really don't have another pass rusher on the practice roster or anything. It's all tackles that they have. It, it's interior guys. So it'll be interesting to see what they do with the roster this week, but um, to miss th- that many guys and still look good was was very impressive and uh i think it just it's one of those things where your head coach is a he's a d-line he's a d-lineman so just one of those little extra things that you can't let the doesn't matter if we're we're shorthanded there we got to do it for this guy because he's a d-lineman too right well and they they rotated corte lake mork in in there as best they could um so like habakkuk baldonado is he still injured or is he back no, he actually had a really, really good uh, tackle on Kadeem Carey in that game because if Carey breaks that tackle, he had probably 30, 40 yards in front of him with nobody around him. So Baldonado he had a plays huge, so angry. huge tackle. He, he he plays like he's angry every time he lines up there. <laughs> uh, if my parents named me Habakkuk too, I think I'd be mad every time I do. But like, th- there, there's some younger talent there. Are, are they to the skill level of a De Beer or Albright, I don't know, but I think we can I think we'll be okay. I, I think the one advantage of having so many injuries at that position is the fact, like you mentioned, with Corey Mace being a defensive line coach, I have faith or sorry, a defensive lineman. Uh 
I have faith in whoever he trots out there to be coached up to, to do the job. That is one spot on the field I have zero concern with, no matter who they line up out there. And we've seen why through four games. Uh, what can be said about the linebacking crew behind the D line? I think they're the best linebacking group in the league. Avery had another huge game. Um, Thurman with another uh, fumble recovery on the Avery uh, forced fumble there. And in all four games, Thurman has a turnover, whether it's a fumble recovery or an interception. They're playing at such an elite level right now. And Revis. You're you're not even hearing anything about CJ Revis, well, which means he's doing saying, his job. It's been so quiet, it's been so quiet talking about him because of what Thurman and Avery are doing, but the dude's lights out. And then that uh, that secondary outside of Marcus Sale's first game where he wasn't good, he's been fantastic. Of course, he had basically the game winning pick six in this one. Um, Milligan two touchdowns. We know he's a stud. Um, Mark What's Fields. Up? Um, you haven't heard his name at all. And usually for a defensive back, that's a very good thing. Um, Deontay Williams had that, uh, had that interception. Uh, Nelson Lacombo at safety has been very, very good. This is a very, very talented secondary. And this was one of the big question marks going into the season was how is this secondary going to shake out? And I think they're doing pretty damn good. It shaked out very, very well. That's how it shaked out. And I know I said this on X, but I, I stand by it. Milligan, if he st- stays healthy, he is going to be the defensive player of the year. He's been their top-rated um, uh, defensive back every week uh, this season so far. Like If he keeps it up, it's going to be very hard to deny him. At, at this point, if somebody on the defense makes a play and you're not watching the game, just assume it was Roland Milligan. He is around the ball like nobody I've seen in years. And as a whole, this defense rushes to the ball consistently. You you never see a guy go down by himself. There's always two, three riders right around whoever has the ball. But Milligan is almost always the first one there, no matter where on the field a play happens. It's his his nose for the football is off the charts. Um, and shout out to Nelson Lacombo because when the game was 30 to 20 receiver caught the ball just in front of him. receiver breaks that tackle. That's a touchdown. And all of a sudden that game is completely different. He made such an, uh, I don't want to say game saving, but almost a game saving tackle because Toronto ended up getting a field goal on that, uh, on that drive. And if they get seven, that's a completely different situation we're seeing with the last two and a half minutes of that game. So it's little things like that, that this team is doing right and doing well. And it's all those little things one by one and you add them all together. And that's how you get four and oh. If there was only, if there was one flaw was I hate Janarian Grant. I hate that man. I was I playing at Old Lake Stadium. I hate that man. Like he that was a great move. Yeah. Like I think the only one that actually had a shot at him was Roland Milligan, who by the way is leading the league in uh, special teams tackles also that tells you how much he's around the ball. And he kind of got pushed to the side, but yeah, Grant made that one move and just right through the middle. It was like the Red Sea parted and he was gone. Like I mean, but, we all uh, remember that kick return last year from from Janarian Grant when he was with Winnipeg. Every time the ball lands in his lap, I die a little inside because I expect him to take it to the house at Mosaic Stadium specifically. That seems to be where he plays his best football. And Winnipeg didn't want to pay him. They could Whoops. probably use him right around now. Um, on the flip side, our kick returner, Mario Alford, he's so close to breaking one. It, it's oh. going to be happening because he already, he does have a punt return for a touchdown. Of course, that was called back in Edmonton due to a, a hold. Um, but he's been excellent again this year. And that missed field goal return, if he breaks that last tackle or if that, that guy gets blocked, he had a full convoy in front of he him. Gone. He there gone. Was, there was about six blockers there, and there was maybe three Argos within about 10, 15 yards of him. He gets those blocks. 
no one's touching him. <laughs> Shout out to and the ref for the best block on that uh, on that return. That was a great screen. He Such he ran heads up. Perfectly. It's, it's a play by Alford, though, to use an official to his advantage. Yeah. I'm going to admit, from my side of the field, the exact opposite of where he picked that up. I had nightmares when he started running into the end zone. And then I saw the pick and went, okay, we're good. We're good. And then, like you, the convoy was there. One miss. He's going to return a couple back this year. We all know it. It's just a matter of when, not if. Well, and see, I wasn't worried about... Uh him going back into the end zone. Cause from my angle where I was in three Oh eight, I was like, Oh yeah, he's got 15 yards. He's 15 yards away from the guy. And then the ref stood in the way too. And yeah, that was, <laughs> he used it perfectly. Um, well, one other thing about that game, um, again, Logan Furland kicking out to tackle, um, my boy, my Trevor boy, Reed, Trevor Reed, um, got hurt cramps we're assuming he's back at practice this week already so that's good news um but uh logan furland goes out to tackle didn't miss a beat out there and zach fry came in at guard played pretty well i think um there fry didn't seem to be a lot of pressure against uh against patterson so um the whole line's been been fairly solid yeah you could say that the the run game still needs improvement which is a fair fair take but Overall, I think the biggest question mark of this team, the O line over the last couple of years, is performing very, very well. I I still stand by every team's stacking the box against AJ, um, and it's our, the yards are going to be hard to get, but AJ has shown, especially in the later uh, quarters, third and fourth. Once he gets rolling, he's just punishing guys. So uh, yards are gonna be hard to get in early in the game, but you keep at it. He's gonna get. He's gonna get his uh, touches, and he's gonna get his yards. AJ is the guy you want to have in October, November when it's minus twenty, and you're you're. I hope it's not minus twenty in game. October. Well, I'm from Saskatchewan. I always expect it to be. Prepare for the worst and hope for the best, right? But our, our O line seems to be getting better. They they've now got a mobile quarterback behind or in front of they've got a mobile quarterback behind them. And uh I, I expect to see them improve more and more. Glad to see that Trevor Reed is back and isn't uh, wasn't injured because we do need him on that left tackle. He's been he's been lights out all season. And that other tackle, Jermarcus Hardrick, um just going back to him and the leadership of this team, I think uh once the very first play when Trevor Reed got hurt and Zach Fry ran onto the field, Hardrick pulled him aside and was explaining things to him. And I don't know, maybe not necessarily calming the nerves, but you know, just getting him ready to go. And I think that was something that was missing over the last couple of years was an on field leader, someone like Jamarcus Hardrick. And you see what Hardrick's doing in the locker room, picking Shea Patterson up like he's going to power bomb him uh, when he gets the, uh, the game ball just picks him up with ease and just trouts him around the, the locker room. Like this is a leader on and off the field and a guy like Hardrick. <laughs> Thank you. Winnipeg for uh, deciding you wanted to go with Eric Lofton oh instead of Andrew Marcus Hardrick, because that's been such a win for us. Well, and, and you look at when there's a touchdown, who's the first guy celebrating with the always person Yoshi. who got the touchdown? It's always, always Yoshi. Yoshi beats everyone there. Like, you're right. The fact that Winnipeg decided we're not paying Jeff Coat, we're not paying Grant, we're not paying Hardrick shows you why they are where they are right now. Um, but yeah, Yoshi has been such a breath of fresh air for this team, both like, yeah, on the field and off the field. He is a leader in the locker room. He's a great personality and it's great to have him back in Ryder Green. It, it's really hard to pick a, an early season favorite for, for best free agent signing between Jameer Thurman and Jamarcus Hardrick. It's, it's a little bit of one, a one B both absolute leaders. And we heard from CJ Avery, how good of a leader uh, Thurman is, but you can just see it with Hardrick. You can see him. He's the first guy everywhere on every play. I, we never should have let him go. I realize that he wouldn't have been a starter when we let him go, but it's really, 
it's nice to have him back where he belongs. Well, the Riders move into 4 and 0. Oh, first time since 2013. G- Greg, I remember what happened in 2013. Oh, what was that? The uh uh Calgary didn't win the Grey Cup. That that is true. I remember that distinctively. Yeah, always um, a good year. Yeah. I'm sure something else happened. Hamilton didn't win it that year. Like, Ham- Hamilton didn't win it either, did they? No, they haven't won in a long time, and that makes yeah. me feel really good, actually. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll, nice. we'll still keep on thinking. Hamilton's we'll responsible keep- for half of our great cups. Be nice. Responsible for half of everybody else's great cups lately, too. Um, <laughs> We're. There's one thing we haven't talked about from that game yet, and I, I do want to get your guys' thoughts on a coaching decision. I'm pretty sure we're we're all going to agree with what Coach Mace did. Third, third and two, two, late in the game, riders up by seven. So was kicking the field goal the right call? Greg, yes, but yes, but yes, it was the right call because it put us up by two scores. However. The way that they were playing, both on offense and defense, even if they didn't get the touchdown, chances are that defense either was going to get a turnover or a safety. So I I, I honestly don't think it, it, it didn't matter in that situation. Either you go up by two scores there or you were going to get the ball back like immediately. The guys in front of us at that game, when the offense was out there, the one guy was freaking out. He was just yelling, kick the field goal, kick the field goal. So, yes, absolutely. I think the right decision was made. Kick the field goal, go up two scores. The only downside to kicking a field goal there is Toronto gets possession at the 40-yard line. Um, so, with the new rules, extra yards that they get just off that. So, that's the that's the only downside. Um but then when the offense was left on the field, the other guy was like, look at the balls on Mace. Um, <laughs> and there's, I mean, but the one thing is if they would have gone for it, I would have appreciated going for the kill shot <laughs> and just saying, you know what? Let's win this game right now. Let's end it. But with the way, I mean, the O-line, the running game wasn't really putting up a lot of yards. It was three, four yards at a time, tough yards. I don't know what they would have done. Probably run some sort of play action. But, I mean, yeah, it would have been cool to see them go for it. And, I mean, last year I was applauding Craig Dickinson for going for it on third and two from their own 35 <laughs> um, early in the game and, and getting it just to set the tone. And I would have, if Mace would have gone for it and gotten it, I would be applauding him right now saying, go for the win, go get that. But the right decision was made. And Greg, like you said, it ultimately, it really didn't matter because I think, you know, 105 yards for Toronto to drive there. They weren't going to do that anyway. No. And that's, and if it was under the three, if, if it was under the three minute mark where they have to return the ball, I think that would also have, uh, did it, but because it was at what three eighteen, three fifteen, like somewhere in there. Yeah, they they got the ball at the forty anyway, so that actually helped Toronto out, which got them to field goal range fairly quickly. But I still think if he would have went for it, there's no way Toronto's going 105 yards on you. Not my, that probably my only my only downside or regret or question mark about that decision was the choice to call the timeout with about eight seconds left on the play clock. I think if you're going to kick the field goal there, drain the clock right down to one. It's a tight game. You know, you're taking that two score lead, but we've seen in the CFL eight, nine seconds can be two plays. I think that was the only question. I think no matter what decision he makes, he made the right one. So he kind of had a win-win situation to, to go with there. Like, I understand why he took the timeout because he had two timeouts to burn anyway. And after three minutes, you can only take one anyway. So he had the timeout there. But at the same time, if you, yeah, if you take that time count penalty, who cares? You take more time off the clock and you just, Lothar's going to nail that chip shot every time anyway. Yeah, that's, that's the one time on the field with that much time left. 
the time count means absolutely nothing. But even if you are taking the time out, drain it down to one. Stand by the ref. They weren't, there was no point at that play where they were going to run a play. The offense was not at the line. They were not ready to run a play. This was not a, oh no, let's stop this decision. This was a, I don't know, a thought out decision by Corey Mace. Just he didn't wait the right amount of time. Literally the only bone to pick from an entire game of coaching decisions. So, Ricky coaches all right. time management. Yeah. He, he must have gone to the Craig Dickinson School of Time Management. Whoa. Too easy. Maybe we won't <laughs> go that far. Uh, that's the opening kickoff presented by Kathy <laughs> Fetchin of Royal LePage Regina Realty. Let's jump to our Churchill Brewing Company odds and end zones. Uh, we'll start with the Argos here because after this game, Cameron Dukes had his four interceptions. Uh, Ryan Dinwiddie went on radio and said Chad Kelly is the starter here in Toronto when he comes back. Um, just want to get your guys' thoughts on that whole situation. I'll let Steve go. Then I'm, I know I'm going to play devil's advocate. <clears throat> I mean, we, we all knew he was going to be the starter. The moment he was out there for the first day at training camp, this team was behind Chad Kelly. They have been behind him from day one. You don't, I don't like it. I don't think it's the right decision, but as a team management decision alone, you're not going to bench last year's MOP unless you have to. And if the league is allowing him back at the end of his nine game, nine game stretch, they're going to go with them. There's, there's no question there. This was, I'm surprised they made this announcement so early, but then it gives the team and the league time to, process it over the next six weeks before he steps on a football field. And with that though, and I've seen a lot of comments from fans from multiple teams going like this guy should be out of the league. You guys are disgraced and whatever. And didn't win his defense. It's not his call. This is a hundred percent on the league. The league put in a process whether it is a valid process everyone wants to agree with, whether it actually does anything, whether it's just lip service at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. The league put in these steps, and as far as the league right now is concerned, Chad Kelly has fo followed every step to get there. Whether we like it or we don't, hate it or not, this is what the league has put in front of Chad Kelly to be able to play again. Unless he does something else, the league can't really go, oh, psych, fooled you, nice try, can't come in the league again. That's not the way this is going to work. So, yes, do I think Chad Kelly is a giant piece of garbage? Sure, I can think that. But I can also understand that, unfortunately, he also is very good at throwing the football and the league wants him in the league. So we just kind of got to accept it and hope uh, – the riders sack him a bunch of times and be fun that way. <laughs> a game that uh, Steve and I will be at in Toronto. Um, and Steve, I see you just moved. Uh, you wrote in our notes here, Sean Lemon practicing. I was going to save that. For I, the I was going to, I, I was going to bring it up too, but good. Um, I was going to save that for the betting segment, but uh, you put it up oh. here. So we'll talk about that. Sean Lemon. Uh, so his uh, um, arbitration hearing got expedited by the, uh, by the league and well no the, it, it didn't it was supposed well, to happen his council wanted it pushed another month and the league said no 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 no. we're all here to do now. this now yeah so either he gets suspended again and we do the arbitration hearing later but either way he's not playing so they the arbitrator agreed he's like okay yeah you guys have plenty of time they we're not kicking this can down the, we're going to kick the can down the line but until then, he can't play anymore. But he can practice. Garbage. <laughs> like, that is garbage. But here's the thing. Can he, is he getting paid? If he's suspended, is he getting paid? Like, no, he wouldn't. I, I'm, very he would I, 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 I'm very confused. If he's suspended, that means he shouldn't get paid. Which then, I kind of respect the guy for being a great teammate. So, what is happening here? But on, on the flip side, the fact that a guy who has bet on a game that he played in and he is still on the sidelines or at practice for a, 
professional football bet team. Bet on yourself, Steve. Always bet on yourself. Is absolutely freaking ridiculous. Like, every other league in sports knows what you do here. The moment there is a betting allegation that can be proven and it is clear they have that information, they're gone for life. It's over. We saw a guy with the Raptors. He was suspended for the for life. For being dumb. <laughs> Lifetime ban. Well, he, yep. he gets bonus points for not even being able to bet properly. <laughs> Good lord. Not even but subtle. Like, like and those and those you don't even know if they were betting on their own games. That is just betting on the sport you play in. Yeah. Sean Lemon bet on a game that he was involved in. He was on the field and had the ability to control that wager's outcome and still is is involved and with an organization in this league, Montreal should be embarrassed. Okay, so I, 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 want, I, I, want to, I want to throw a hypothetical at you guys because I've seen a lot of people go, well, he bet on the team to win. It wasn't that much. I got a hypothetical for you. I want to know if that argument would work for the following situation. Let's say there's a defensive lineman on a team who bet on the, his team to win. And he goes and breaks the quarterback's leg on the other side. Would s- people still say, well, it's not that big a deal. He just he bet on his team to win. Who's the team? Is it the <laughs> Saskatchewan Rough Riders? Because I guarantee people have a different uh, opinion based on that alone. Well, that's what I mean. It's like, oh, well, he bet on his team to win. Yeah, but okay. So as a defensive lineman, I take a few, a few extra shots at the quarterback. I injure him on purpose because I know I have money on this game. Like, it's a slippery slope. Do oh, not yeah, totally. bet in the league you play in. That is common sense. Yeah. Hashtag most most other sports don't even allow you to bet on sports, period. Not even the sport you play in, but to wager on sports at all. And we have a guy that is wagering on a game he is in. And the league was still celebrating him. TSN was highlighting him. They should have been ignoring his existence and and pretending he wasn't there or pointing out the ridiculousness of the fact that he's on the field. And yes, I get the irony of him being ostracized while wearing a betting logo on his jersey. There, there's a whole other argument to that, but this is, it just keeps getting dumber and dumber as this goes along. Like the fact that he could go to camp and then he could play while he was being, uh, while, while we were waiting for the hearings outcome. And now that, that that's dealt with, he can practice while he waits for the outcome. No, get him out of the league. If this is overturned, then you deal with it. But the league didn't entire- make this decision if they didn't have proof. But the entire argument about, oh, it's not fair because players now wear betting logos on them. Like, riders have bumper to bumper on their logo. Just be, or like, does it mean they can't go to AutoZone? Like, who? Like, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. He's where he's wearing a betting logo on his jersey. It's oh. not fair. Like, come on. Oh, it's absurd. Grown ass man. It, it's been a rule in sports as long as you could wager on sports. The, one of the best hitters, if not the best hitters in baseball history, will never be involved in the Hall of Fame because he bet on games. This is how it is. They know this. They've known this their entire lives. He got caught. Honestly, I, I hope to God when the time comes and he's eligible for the Hall of Fame, it doesn't happen. Because if he gets in there, it's an embarrassment. The thing is, though, it's not it's a Canadian Football Hall of Fame. It's a bunch of old reporters that do it. And sorry, Daryl, if you listen, I, I'm not calling you an old reporter, but you know what I mean. He doesn't Just reporter. everybody else. <laughs> yeah. And I, I know for a fact Daryl doesn't listen, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> this will be the one uh-huh. episode. Yeah. Pete Rowe should be in the Hall of Fame. Um, Edmonton Elks <laughs> signed Derek Moncrief, <laughs> uh, former rider in their bye week along with Sean Oakman, which we all kind of saw that one coming. Um, But signing Derek Moncrief, is that desperation from a team that's 0-4 that needs to try and do something to get a win? It's 
It's it's very weird to be in year three of a Chris Jones uh, rebuild to have a year one rotation of players out and in. <laughs> Get out of my I, head. I, <laughs> I I I think Jones is feeling the heat. Like he has to be. Like this team has not gotten any better. Like typically year three is when a Chris Jones team is fi- like finally starting to find its footing, and they're getting worse. They're fighting with him on the sidelines. But like, if you look at the bad. team, the team on the field is getting better. That's the funny part. Yes, they're zero and four, and I, we won't get. Alex going on a rant about being better than your record. They are not better than their record. They are 0-4. Nope. But this is not the bad football teams of the last few years. This is They are getting to the point where they might actually win games again. They are competitive in every game that they play. They might win one by accident. That's new for them. But it's just... This is, this is like you said, this is the epitome of a Chris Jones year one bye week move. Sign five, release five, and go after the big names. We saw him do that with guys like uh, Greg Hardy and, oh my God, why can't I remember the quarterback's name? Vince Young. Young, Young. Vince Young. Like, these are the things he does early on. Still not Cleve Mitchell. him doing it now is, (laughs) oh, Greg Hardy and Khalif Mitchell. That was a... That was a fun what, month in Rider Nation. What, what a time, time to be a fan. What a yep. time. I they're gonna they're gonna put it together eventually, but to see these moves is just strange. I don't I, I wonder if the private ownership news and the idea that something's coming has has that fire under Craig Jones or Chris Jones. Sorry, I'm still in last year with Craig Dickinson. Under under Chris Jones kind of heating things up. Um, another former rider, uh, Jamal Morrow, apparently signed with Calgary, but uh, failed his physical yet again. So he oh. is not signed with Calgary. Um, starting to feel bad I, for him now. I feel bad for him. He's such a good dude. Good dude, solid player. The only one that gave a damn during the George Reed game. Like, if, if the Riders would have brought him back this season, I would have been, I've been okay with it. But unfortunately, well, if he could pass a physical, I guess, but. Yeah, it sucks. Like it's not a great way for a guy's career, CFL career, to end because it's gonna be really hard for another team to sign him if he keeps on failing physicals. I, I hope he ends up somewhere. Like you both said, he, he's a good dude, solid running back. If it were not for whatever is holding him back at the physical, I'm hoping it's the same thing, and he has progressed, just not to the level they need, and maybe there's hope for him. But to fail physicals not once but twice, that's going to have other teams turning around and walking away before they even think about signing them, let alone getting to, you know, ink on the contract. I got to wonder, though, why does Calgary keep on announcing they've signed them until b- before the physical? Like, why not no, run see, the well, physical, then the major announcement? Dunk announcing it. Yeah, I this, guess. Yeah. This, is, this is the sources outside, not the team. I don't think the team's announced it yet, have they? Because they won't until I, everything's. Passed. I th- I thought I saw the stamps sign uh, announcing this this time, but maybe it was a dunk uh, a dunk post. But. Um, want to really quickly go through a couple games last week, um, but like a one liner on each one, um, except for the Ottawa Winnipeg game because there's a discussion to be had there. Um, Calgary Montreal, um, come back from Montreal to win, which was great because, um, anytime. Calgary loses. It's a good day, especially when they dominated basically the first three quarters of that game. Um, And I think Calgary Stampeder fans are finally starting to see what I see in Jake Mayer, that he is not the guy because I see a lot of Stamps fans complaining about him now. Jake bad. That's, that's all I can say about that. Jake (laughs) is not good. Like, yeah, you, you, you were, you were quick out of the gate with that one. I thought, you know, it, Young quarterback, he'll find no, he he ain't found it. Montreal, though, like, come on, guys. I need you to cover that game. Like, it <laughs> shouldn't have been that hard. That was an easy one. At, at this should point, what do you even one. say about Montreal? They're just they're the, the clear top dog in the CFL, despite what Alex says in his power ranking. Two wins. It counts as two wins for a backup quarterback. 
making his first career start. I am. I'm not going to argue. Let's talk to the CFL, get that included. The Riders are 5-0 and now, but Mon- no, Montreal just is just the dominant. It doesn't count for the standings. No, no, make it count for the standing. standing. Only in Saskatchewan. Sure. No. sure. Only if they win, though. <laughs> um, BC Hamilton. That was the Timmy Chang appreciation night um, in Hamilton. Guy who had one touchdown, seven interceptions in his CFL career. And uh, they basically honored that by being awful, which is made a lot of sense, actually. Um, so they did it all game long. Closest they ever got was 16 points. Like, that was just bad. At BC, came, like BC came, and I don't know, maybe they're reading my notes saying they played to their competition, but they came to just, like, punch Hamilton in the face repeatedly. Like McKinnis had what a hundred over a hundred yards in the first quarter. Yeah. yeah like, I, I like oh. Christina Costa Biles tweet. Something along the lines of, have you thought about maybe covering Justin McKinnis? Like yeah, Ty Cats fans put that very well, by the way. <laughs> it's the epitome of domination and shout out to, I wish I could remember the Ty Cats name, like whoever got their last touchdown for celebrating and taking a game misconduct penalty. For celebrating to go down 16 points with zeros on the clock. That is why you're 0 and 4. That is horrid. In game, when you're down by 20 points, like they were, and you get a touchdown, I can see the celebration. I can understand that. You're especially if you're doing it just by yourself, you're trying to get yourself psyched up. Okay, let's go. Let's get back in this. I get that. It's the whole mindset thing. Let's get back in this game. This was absolute garbage in garbage time to do this. Like it was fitting that it was in garbage time. And it looked not only that, but it's making, you know, fingers with your or guns with your finger fingers guns. and pointing it at the opponent, like at your opponent. Like, what are you doing? That just shows how one classless you are, um, but also how out of touch you are with your surroundings here at the f- on the football field. You're clearly only playing for yourself. You're zero five now, and honestly, with the way that Hamilton's been, and and the way that everything's gone, it looks good on them. I'm gonna be pretty petty right now and just say that it looks really, really good, especially for a couple fans um, in Hamilton. That zero and five winless looks good on them right now. I I, I want to like it reminded me of. God, I can't remember what year it was. They were honoring the 69 Grey Cup team. It was Kent and Keith, and we were just getting pummeled by Calgary. Like, it was embarrassing. Keith gets a touchdown. I think it was shortly after the Gabos incident, and Ryder fans I know know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> and he is celebrating, like, we've won the Grey Cup, and we're down by, like, 20 or 30. Like, it was ridiculous. And I just remember up in the university section, like, come on, you're losing. Why are you celebrating? I I hate celebrating at all if you're losing by two scores. I think it's ridiculous. Get back to the huddle. Put more points on the board. Celebrate when you've won the game. But to celebrate with zeros on the clock. The absurdity of celebrating with zeros on the clock when you're losing a football game. I don't know if I've ever seen that. Just they should be embarrassed at that point in the game, let the alone fact, trying the fact to that celebrate. Got a flag. Like, like if, if I was the ref, I'd be like, come on, man, don't be an idiot. I'm not pulling the flag right now. The fact that he got a flag for it. Hey, the refs play till the end of the whistle as well, too. <laughs> Good for him. Um, it would have been really funny if that was his second misconduct and he had to be walked off the field with zeros on the clock, too. That would have been just Jeff's kiss. Um, and one more really quick note on that Vernon Adams Jr. is on record breaking pace right now, which is insane to see. Um, and so Ottawa is Alexander went... Hollins. Yeah, that whole offense. This this is gonna be a fun game this weekend. Best um, best. We'll get to that right away here. Really quick, Ottawa Winnipeg. The hits on Drew Brown sliding. Um, then Strevler, same thing, sliding, took a late hit. 
Um, that one they had to review to get the call right. Um, and then in the Calgary game, was it? No, it was, was it the Calgary game? It was one of the other games that, um, yeah, it was Cody Fajardo slid and the Calgary defender recognized in real time that the quarterback's going down. He adjusted his flight and ended up taking out his own, you know, defensive uh, teammate as well too. Um, but I've seen Glenn Suter come out and say quarterbacks need to slide sooner. And all of a sudden the quarterbacks who are taking headshots are the ones at fault here. Do you guys agree with that? Because I think that was the Calgary instance just, proves how wrong Glenn Suter is to me on this. The defender can adjust midair and not hit a quarterback in the head. Because those two hits in that Ottawa Winnipeg game were dirty. And both those players should have been ejected. Because if you're serious about protecting one players, two, your quarterbacks, who you're trying to make stars, you have to protect them. And the, the, the officials botch those wait you're telling me that glenn Suter's wrong about something wow there, there's a but, first time for everything greg i i i guess <laughs> but no like glenn is going to obviously uh fade the uh fade the offense and pump up the defense um and the, but then you and to be fair you see those stupid plays in the ncaa with that guy that did the fake slide that ran for like another 40 yards after that. <laughs> that was pretty brilliant. Like after, after, yeah, it was, but at, at that point he should be like, if he yeah. got his head knocked off after that, he deserved it. That said, you're right. Drew Brown, Chris Revler, both nasty hits should not be in this league. Both guys should be gone. But that effect, that hit took Br uh, Brown out of the game, which I'm telling you right now, if Ottawa was in that game, they, if Drew Brown was in, they probably would have won that game. Yep. Cause crumb sucks. Yeah. Very much so. There was no crime back I was, on this one. I was listening to the uh, to Derek Taylor's call, and all I heard for the next however long was it a quarter of football was crumb back this, crumb back that. I guess it was the just before the end of the first half, was it? Yeah, it was just nonstop yeah. talk about Dustin Crumb. He might beat out Chris Strebler for most overrated quarterback in this league. And also, thank you for being such a big supporter and fan of the CFL and myself personally. Show him. Show him, Steve. You are a big supporter. You have the friendship bracelet that has the heart Strevler. You're wearing it right now. He's wearing it. He's wearing it. Yes. <laughs> There's a reason my hand is up this high in the recording, just so you know. His uh, name got said three times. It's like Beetlejuice. He had to come to the head <laughs> He shows up. I'm, I, I got nothing else to say. I, okay. You say his name uh, and he appears. Um, but anyway, sliding hits on the quarterback. Um, it's all of a sudden saying that it's the quarterback's fault that he got hit to me is ridiculous when you're trying to promote player safety. Um, you can, you can make adjustments when you're trying to, Normally on the person that says when the defenders go in full tilt, trying to hit you, it's hard to stop. And it is, but you can do things to adjust while you're doing that. Not, you know, elbow a guy and crash your arm down into his head, into the turf and give him, give him a concussion, which is exactly what happened to Drew Brown. And if you're, if you're preaching player safety, then let's be serious about it. But clearly the CFL doesn't care about player safety. They talk the talk, but they've never walked the walk on it. So, do we do we see supplemental discipline for both of those hits? Maybe I, I think you have to. Yeah, maybe. But they'll the, they'll uh, they'll appeal it, and nothing's going to happen. The the couple <laughs> thousand dollar fine, big deal. All right, well let's let's get back to the riders here. Preview the game a little bit here. Riders Lions Saturday at five o'clock. Um, first in the West. We've talked about it. We'll start there. The DBs, the Riders defense against the Lions offense, and Vernon Adams Jr. on historic pace. Uh, the Lions wide receiving group, arguably, probably with 
to in my mind with the Riders as number one in the league, uh, with Montreal kind of right there. Those top those three teams have the best receivers in the in the league right now. Um, Calgary wasn't there. I've been told they're number up, one in the in the league. He he kind of walked that back. Danny Austin kind of walked that back a little bit. Oh, did he? Um, I I wouldn't know. A little bit, not not fully, but a little bit. Um, Were you blocked by Danny Austin? We've been over this in the people's yes. DMs. Yes, I am, and I don't know why. <laughs> no. I don't know. I didn't know you could be blocked by Danny Austin. He's like the nicest he's the guy. Uh, he, guy. You know, oh you know, yeah, he's 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 quick to block people that cross yeah. him, and I'm pretty sure he, there might have been a few wobbly pops when I said something I probably shouldn't have, but I have no idea why. <laughs> um, what do you guys uh, think of this matchup? Riders defense versus the Lions offense. I'm excited. Like this is going to be win, lose, or draw. This is going to be a fun matchup. I think it's going to be a tight game. I think it's going to be uh, high flying. Uh, it's probably might even be high scoring actually, as much as good as our defense is, because BC's uh, offense is that good. But I think it's going to be a tight game. I think it's going to be fun. No matter what you do, take the over on this one because there are going to be points on the board. It's just a matter of. Whose defense is scoring points? I I'm excited to see this defensive backfield, especially against the group of receivers that that BC's got. You have to get pressure on Vernon Adams. We've shown we can do that. You have to contain William Stanback. We've shown we can do that. But to stop that receiving core is going to take a team effort across the board. You're going to have to play at your best. And I expect guys like Marcus Thales especially to come out. This is a team that cut him. They're gonna, he's going to come out of this game angry. I want to see him light somebody up on the first drive. You know he's, he's got a good hit in him somewhere. I hope he gets up from it, unlike the uh, – who was that? It was two weeks ago where he nailed somebody and, and stayed down. But it's going to be a, a solid game of football. It's going to be a great best-on-best best battle. My biggest fear is, if you look at last year, the Riders under the previous uh, coaching staff held Vernon Adams very, very tight. Problem is, though, when Vernon got knocked out of the game, <laughs> for some reason, Dane Evans was this team's kryptonite. So, with Jake, the ghost of Jake Dolagala light up the Riders? Who knows? <laughs> I'm sorry, are you new Lord, to Ryder Nation? The backup quarterback is always our kryptonite. It will always well, no, be I, I, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. <laughs> I, I just can't wait for Jake Dolagala to light up the Riders. <laughs> then we have to live through an entire media cycle of, the Riders never should have got rid of uh, Jake Dolagala. They, they kept fine over Jake, and then they cut fine, and we, now we're stuck with uh, a losing uh, quarterback and Shea Patton. Like, I, I, I'm going to hate this team if we lose, especially if, Pat, if uh, Dolagala comes in. Well, to me, the key is is getting Vernon Adams Jr. uncomfortable. He's still going to run around. He's still going to make some plays. That is proven. He's going to do it. Actually, Steve, I think you posted that the last, maybe it was Dave, actually, but the last time that uh, Vernon Adams Jr. faced a Corey Mace defense, uh, he threw six interceptions. So definitely Corey Mace. Me. Okay, maybe that was Dave. Um, Corey Mace knows what to do against Vernon Adams. Apparently the, the track record is there um, with this ball hawking secondary. They're going to be taking chances. This is going to be a fantastic matchup, but the key is just to get Vernon Adams jr. Uncomfortable pressure him to the outside. And yeah, he has a scrambling available or ability, but force him to make some throws. He'll make some, but capitalize on the ones he doesn't. So that's going to be fun to watch. But also, I hope it's not a shootout. You guys are talking about how it's going to be a high-scoring game. I don't know if the Riders' offense with Shea Patterson can keep up with an offensive shootout. Not with BC, anyway. Um, so that, that'll that be interesting to see. Especially, you know, got his first win. Got his, you know, legs under him. How is he going to build for that second game? Is he going to be a little bit more confident in the first quarter? 
because if he comes out shaking the first quarter, I don't like the Riders' chances in this one. But if he comes out playing like he did in the second, third, and fourth last week against Toronto, he comes out playing with that kind of confidence, making smart throws. Um, they they can be in this, and it's to me it, it's for the Riders' offense. It comes down to the run game. It needs to take take charge for no other reason than just time of possession. Keep the ball away from Vernon Adams Jr. If you can get into second and four, second and three, instead of second and seven, second and six, if you can get those extra couple yards on first down. It's just going to make that much of a difference. And just extending drives, keep the chains moving, even if it's a bunch of field goals, that's fine. Just keep the ball away from Vernon Adams Jr. So I just pulled up the stats. BC, so uh, opponent rushing yards, who's the best? Who do you think? The Riders. Defensive. Yeah, Riders, right? Yeah. 184 yards total through four games. BC, 400. Like, the Riders can probably get, get A.J. Ouellette to carry this game if they really wanted them to. Like th- this is this is the game made for AJ Watt. 184 total yards given up on the ground so far. Yep. That's pretty good. That's That's pretty that's good. Under 1000 yards for the season. That's insane. Uh and uh Toronto is second with 211, I think. I just lost that stat. Uh 211 and then BC's third with 416 and Winnipeg's the most with 558. So it looks like there's a lot of consistency between three and nine. And there's us in Toronto sitting at the top. So I, I think this will be the game that we can probably get our uh, our rushing game going. Well, that's what I'm looking forward to seeing is if can they get that rushing game going um, for Shea Patterson? He gets another uh, uh, important target with uh, Sean Bain Jr. Coming back for this game, of course, missed last week. We found out the personal reasons. It was his sister who passed away. Uh, so he went to to obviously be with the family. Um, back at practice on, on Tuesday here. So we know he, he'll be back for this one. But just another offensive weapon where all Shea Pedersen has to do is, is be that point guard. Just distribute the ball where it needs to go and let the playmakers do it. Um, and if they're given the effort like they were last week, talked about, the Sam Amelis spin touchdown and KSB fighting for extra yards. If they're doing that again, then there's a real chance that the, the riders can, I don't want to say steal this one. Um, but I know they're not the favorites going into this game. So in that sense, yeah, maybe steal this one. What surprised me the most with the offense last week and what I hope we see more out of Patterson and this offense this week is using AJ Ouellette as a passing game option. I don't think we threw the ball at him once last week. I don't remember a single screen hitch, anything in his direction. And that worked well to get AJ going the week before. You need mm-hmm. those short plays. So hopefully we see some of that to keep uh, keep BC's D-line a little more honest and give Patterson the time to work with. Okay. Well... Let's uh, let's get to Greg. Do you have it queued up this week? I do. Are you ready? This week. All right, perfect. Let's get to our Piffles picks. Piffles picks. Well, folks, when you're right 52% of the time, you're wrong 48% of the time. <laughs> and Greg, that's uh, pretty much your record being. Uh, 10 I, I mean, on I, that, season. that 52. I'm, I'm, I want that 52 by the end of the year. Um. I just noticed that I kept my record up from last week and totally got rid of your guys' because I was 4-0. and um, Well, games this week against the spread. Um, Toronto, first game of the week, Toronto at Montreal. Um, Montreal, I'm guessing, is probably favored by 5.5. I'm going to go 4, Montreal. 9.5. Wow. Um 
Wow. Toronto's getting Again. no no respect after uh, after the game in uh, Saskatchewan. And two straight losses for Toronto kind of makes sense, I guess. Um, something's wrong in Toronto right now. Um, Cameron Dukes obviously last week was was not that good with the four interceptions, but during that, and we didn't even talk about it when we talked about Chad Kelly was tweeting, "Nah, nope, negative." Um, all these different He's words for seats. no. He's got the receipts though. Yeah, all these different, you know, words for no, which is funny because clearly he doesn't know the definition of the word no. Um something's wrong in Toronto. There there's something off with that team right now. Um so for that reason I'll take Montreal. I think they cover. I I'm taking Toronto on this one. That's that's too big of a spread for for this team to to cover, I think. I made that mistake last week. I'm not doing it again. Montreal let me down last week on the cover, but I got taken this week. I I I agree. I don't see uh, Cameron Dukes having a bounce back game. I think they Montreal. I don't think Montreal falls behind as much as they did against Calgary. I think they came out flat footed. I don't see them making that same mistake twice. So I think it's going to be a route in Montreal. And you mentioned earlier, Roland Milligan is Defensive Player of the Year if he stays healthy. Beverett out in. Montreal is my pick for the most outstanding defensive player this year. He's been insane. He's pretty good. He's pretty good. Not bad. Um, second game on Friday, Calgary at Winnip- Winnipeg. Sorry, Winnipeg. Um, I, Zach Claros, I think, is back for this one. He's practiced he a couple is. days in full with his thorax injury. His thorax is healthy. Yes. Um, my guess is that Winnipeg's favored by three yeah i'm gonna go four and a half again so close guys two and a half uh i don't know what to make of this game because if zach claros is playing they're not gonna throw a touchdown that's for sure they're they're not any better they are legit not any better and but it's jake mayer mayer's bad well, for the greater good, do I dare chance it again? All right, for the greater good, I'll take I'll take Winnipeg. The greater good. The greater good. The greater good. Hoping uh, I'm wrong just for Winnipeg to lose again. I, I, I don't want to you. I I don't think Calgary can cover two and a half. I. Calgary is a bad team, but Winnipeg's. I don't know. This sucks. All right. Do I have a coin? Uh, I, exactly. I'm like I'm looking around here. I have a coin. The queen will tell me what to do. Tails is he's Calgary. Not... Heads is Winnipeg. Okay, I was gonna say he's just gonna flip it and then just pick without saying who's who. <laughs> it's Winnipeg. All right. And I'm I'm going Calgary. Okay. Um, the Riders at BC. I'm gonna go with BC by six and a half. I'm going BC seven. Uh, seven. Sorry, Alex got it. The oh. sound didn't want to work. Six and a half. However, there are places where you can get the Riders plus twelve. Oh, if you can get them plus twelve, you're I'm taking that all day long. Oh yeah, take take plus twelve. You can get to plus twelve. Take them plus twelve. I think I, this is a game where. Sorry, Steve. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. I think this is the game where um, the Riders stumble just a little bit. Um, I'm. I don't want to say I'm going in expecting them to lose, but I'm okay if they do with this one. This is a tough matchup, and I think they're going to learn a lot from losing to a team like BC. Not that I want them to, because I don't. Um, I think they keep it close. I think they're they're in it all the way. And then maybe it's a, a field goal with a minute or so left that just pushes it past seven points for BC. So I think it's a close game, but I think BC ends up winning and covering this just by, by a hair. I, I think I... you're right on the last second field goal, but I think it's for a win. I think some. I think this is coming down to a late game play. 
inside of that seven point or six and a half points. I'll I'll take the Riders with that spread. I'm I'm taking the Riders plus six and a half. I I'm definitely going to take them plus twelve. But <laughs> I, I I yes, I think if BC wins, it's going to be a lot tighter than people expect. I don't see BC to blow the doors off Saskatchewan, especially because of the Corey Mace effect on Vernon Adams. I, I think the Riders are going, to turn, uh, are going to get some turnovers. So, yeah, I'm going to take the – with six and a half points, I'm taking the Riders. Should be a fantastic game, honestly. It really should be. I, I think it's going to be the best game this season, like it, it, it up this far. Like there might be some good ones near the end of the season, but this is going to be a marquee matchup this week, even without Trevor Harris. Yep. Um, and the final game, Ottawa at Edmonton. Edmonton, two and a half. I'm going Edmonton, three and a half. You guys went both sides of it, three. Ah. <laughs> um, well, Drew Brown's still in concussion protocol. Don't know his availability just yet. There, there's assuming... places where you can get Ottawa plus eight, but I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even entertain that. Uh, yeah, with. Chances are Dustin Crum playing this game. I think this is the game that Edmonton finally wins. So I'll take them to cover that spread. I'm I'm taking Edmonton to win by three for sure. No, oh, Edmonton with a field goal? Of course, I'm taking that too. Uh, I forgot to mention the Saskatchewan BC line uh, matchup is the highest of the week for total at 52 and a half. I can see that going over. Yep. Uh, the, the lowest to no surprise, Calgary at Winnipeg at 47. Yep. That, that <laughs> checks out. Might go under on that one, actually. All right. Well, there's our picks for this week. I hope I'm wrong on, on two of them. And I can go full. What's his name? Smooth Jimmy Apollo. Yep, smooth Jimmy Paulo. When you're right fifty two percent of the time, you're wrong forty eight percent of the time. Yeah, I'm hoping I'm right around that that range this week. But that's going to do it for us here on the Piffles Podcast. Greg, you're going on vacation. Um, yeah, you actually so need a replacement, Greg, next week. I know. Replacement, I know Greg, you next one, week. You teased one early, but uh, next week you definitely need me. I did. Um, and replacement we'll Steve, be replacement Greg. Possibly. He, I, I've, see, I've seen him say a lot of things that agree with me, so I think my understudy, he's not a replacement, he's my understudy. <laughs> like, So I, I believe he's uh, picking up what I'm putting down, so I, I think he could, uh, he could slide in very well. Well, we'll see who we, we can wrangle up for uh, for next week with uh, Sans Greg. But but who's going to play the Streveler video if I'm not here? Oh, I'll play it. Don't worry. Okay, good. Okay, good. He played it once in the pre-show too, so you're I did. you're golden. <laughs> um, but we'll we'll do that all next week when we're talking about hopefully another Riders win, um, pushing their record to five and zero. But it should be a pretty good game against uh, against BC here. Real, I mean, we're talking going into Toronto is going to be a measuring stick game. This is the real measuring stick game um, because these two teams are just so far and above better than everyone else in the West right now and everyone else other than Montreal in the CFL, that this should be just a, a fantastic game. And I, I just, normally this would be a game with any other regime. I could see them getting blown out in, and I just cannot see that right now. This was the game where the, the riders would go to BC, be leading by 20 points with three minutes left and still blow it. <laughs> That is my lived experience. We've we've seen it happen. All right. Well, Greg, have a good vacation. And um, right. Steve, we'll, we'll chat, well, tomorrow, probably. Um, but we'll see each other next week. Till then, Piffles Podcast, brought to you by our great friends at Dairy Queen on Elphinstone Street and Sass Drive in Regina. Special thanks, of course. Go to Kathy Festion of Royal LePage Regina Realty and Churchill Brewing Company for their support, making this show possible. Thanks for watching. Uh, on YouTube or Sastel Max TV on demand, listening wherever you get your podcasts. This is Tyler Gilbert with Ghost Behind Your Mind. The Ghost.